Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 34th annual Great Lakes Day. Great Lakes Day is sponsored by Michigan Sea Grant, Michigan State University Institute of Water Research, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and MSU Extension as a part of ANR Week at Michigan State University. My name is Angela Scapini, and I'll be your MC for the day. We would now like to introduce Dr. Tyler Bassett with Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Dr. Tyler Bassett is a botanist and plant ecologist with the Michigan Natural Features Inventory and Michigan State University Extension. He studies the ecology, classification, and management of ecosystems with a focus on the rare plant species they support. In particular, he has a passion for understanding and restoring the fragmented and fire suppressed prairie savanna landscapes of the upper Midwest. He has worked in private, public, nonprofit, and academic spheres for over 20 years to bring the science and practice of conservation and restoration together to improve outcomes for biodiversity. Dr. Bassett earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Western Michigan University in 2000 and a PhD from Michigan State University in 2017. Please welcome Dr. Bassett. Hello, thank you so much. So on this Great Lakes Day, I will be discussing not lakes per se, um, but I'll be discussing some terrestrial ecosystems that are heavily influenced by uh, Lake Superior in particular. So I'm really excited to be talking about this, this project that uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory or MNFI, MNFI uh, that we engaged in with um, the coordination of the Nature Conservancy, and I'll tell you about the partnership a little bit um, as I go along. So uh, my partners in this, my field partner and uh, from MNFI is Jesse Lincoln. That's him on the on the bottom of the stream uh, screen with the uh, charred piece of uh, tree from a lightning strike. And the other guy next to the still standing tree, that's Doug Pearsall from TNC, who kind of we worked with closely on this particular project. So... So we did this project in what's called the Keweenaw Heartlands, and you can see it there on the map. If you don't know where the Keweenaw is, the peninsula within the peninsula, there it is on the inset in the lower right. So that's a property made up of four different parcels as labeled there, but that's uh, parcel names are not that relevant. So this area was purchased by TNC in 2022, because uh, you can see 32,540 acres, which is enormous. It's a large chunk of land. And they did it with some contributions and collaboration with the Michigan DNR, with the Keweenaw County, and, and at least one township up there. And the as you can see in the legend in the upper left, uh, that, that tan color is existing conservation and recreation lands prior to the purchase. Uh, this Keweenaw Heartlands increased that amount from 22,000 and some to over 55,000 conservation and recreation lands. So it's a big bump for Keweenaw County. Uh, the the Keweenaw Heartlands was purchased from a logging company who purchased it from another logging company. And so there's a, the, the area has been uh, clear cut and otherwise logged many times. And that goes back to the beginning of European uh, use of this area, the colonization or settlement, and that included a lot of mining too, which was kind of what spurred a lot of the initial logging. So has been cut over quite a bit, but um, assessments were done in order to, to figure out what, you know, what was still on this landscape, both in terms of vegetation and cultural features, and then also sort of the timber assets because of all the stakeholders, folks wanted to continue using the land for all the purposes that people use land, including timber, including recreation, lots of mountain bikes and ORV use up there. So it's a very, very complex conservation uh, issue right up here. So the role of MNFI and what I'll be talking about today was to document the best of the best that, that was left on this landscape, which is generally what we do. So documenting the occurrence of, of high quality natural communities or ecosystems, as well as rare plant species when we encountered them. And so TNC could use this as a basis for, for writing conservation restrictions as they transfer the properties 
over to the eventual owners, which will not be the Nature Conservancy for the most part. So all those partners listed there, they're going to end up with, with the land. Um, so a little bit of background about the Keweenaw, and then we'll get into showing lots of pictures and lots of maps of this beautiful landscape. And I will be discussing a fair bit about you know, what the Great Lakes did to shape this actual landscape in these ecosystems uh, that I'll be talking about. So this is a this is a bedrock geology map of Michigan, kind of a basic resource and understanding of what's beneath the soil that's beneath our feet. Uh, generally, the stuff in the center of of the uh, of the lower mitt there that's the youngest stuff. And as you follow that arrow, it gets older and older until it gets to the billions of years old, which is the Western UP, and that's what we were dealing with. So there's the area we're working in. Uh, you can see the Keweenaw and you can see Isle Royale sticking out there. And you can see that they are mapped as the same rock formation because they are part of the same rock formation. And as that, as, as that volcanic rock was formed, you know, billion plus years ago, and then tropical seas formed and sedimentary rocks like sandstone uh, kind of mixed in with it all and, and the land kind of shifts, you can see that both ends of that Isle Royale and Keweenaw on, on either ends are kind of uplifted up. And so they are part of the, the same chunk of rock that is mostly submerged under Lake Superior, I think, which is a, just a fascinating thing to know. Uh, some of the rocks that make up the landscape include this basalt flow, sort of typical volcanic rock that flowed out over uh, erupting volcanoes one to four billion years ago. And that tends to be that smooth gray color there's also lots of sandstones, lots of banded sedimentary rock that formed on the bottom of, of oceans, slightly more recently in the, in the hundreds of millions. And there's also these conglomerate rocks, which kind of like chunks everything together. And those there's a band of conglomerate rock, a uh, very prominent band along one of these ridge lines. And so here's a here's a cool elevation map showing the 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 prof that prof the other end of what's on IRL that kind of got shoved up and because of that process it bent and buckled and then there, there's these parallel ridge lines along the Keweenaw Peninsula here very very tip where we were working um, in elevation there shown in meters but that 470 top part that's about you know 1500 feet so it's it's pretty high up in some in some spots a pretty pretty dramatic landscape as you might imagine. And for those who are skiers, a little reference here. Um, some some of the newer ski hills in Michigan, that's Mount Bohemia and that's Mount Voodoo, if you're familiar with those spots. So just to give you a reference. I'll, I'll show some other references too, in case folks are needing to know that. Uh, the vegetation circa 1800, so you know, just before Europeans, wide, the widespread colonization of Michigan, dominated by what we would call a mesic northern forest here mapped as sugar maple yellow birch that's that's that uh that uh light green yellowish color so that was the dominant and that's most of what's been logged um that's also the process of hundreds of thousands of years of, of glaciers moving back and forth and also over 8,000 years of indigenous cultures shaping the landscape with fire and, and their own mining and everything else that uh, those indigenous cultures did on the landscape before Europeans showed up. So what did we actually do in order to assess these high quality natural communities and pinpoint, you know, what, what is the best stuff for conservation moving forward in this landscape? We looked at a whole bunch of aerial imagery, a whole bunch of products that kind of told us about the landscape and set these priorities. Red, white, and blue was the, the colors we ended up with, so you can see that on the map. You can see a lot of it's covered. Uh, we started by going after the ones and then and then kind of went, went from there. So we were looking for areas of exposed bedrock. And so that's areas of what we call glades or balds or cliffs. And we'll see examples of these. Uh, we're looking for old growth or really old second growth forests. So you can see an, an, an uncut uh, lightning struck tree on the left and you can see a stump, a recent stump on the right. So we're avoiding the areas with the recent stumps. We're also looking, we were also looking for open peatlands. So fens, bogs, meadows, and without major disruptions to the way the water flows through them. So it kind of a, ensures 
high quality situations. And we're also looking for examples of all those things in conjunction with each other. So the, the picture that came up with the open peatlands, you can see in the distance, there's some high quality forest on a, on a high area. And you can see that open peatland, in this case, it's a bog surrounded by some swamp forests. So we're looking for intact chunks of the entire landscape. And real quickly, I'll just flip through some slides of what it looks like of us doing our work. Uh, so covering a lot of ground, taking a lot of notes, uh, measuring tree, tree width, coring trees to get their age, coring soil to get the what kind of soil it is and what the pH of the soil and understanding places this way. And entering it not just in notebooks, but also using the technology we have at our fingertips. So there's, there's Jesse in the bottom right. Tipping, tipping and tapping away at a, uh, at a tablet, which is how we do a lot of our work. So enough about all that. Let's see some cool pictures. Uh, so the results of our work, and I just want to start off by saying that this is, we could have done more if we had more time. This landscape was phenomenal. So what we did was we documented 40 occurrences of 13 different natural communities. So the, the types I listed a couple slides ago. So those volcanic bedrock ones, both upland and lowland forests, and several open peat, peatlands. Uh, the legend on the bottom right here lists the names of those communities. And we'll be seeing an example of, I think, every single one of those communities in uh, the slides to come here. So if you sum all that up, it added up to about 1,500 acres or about 5% of the project area that we mapped as, hey, this is really good stuff. This is, the, this is the stuff that we want conservation to focus on. If we had another few weeks, we could have covered more ground and documented even more. So there's certainly more work to be done. So I'll start by showing off some of these volcanic bedrock primary communities. Uh, for reference, I, have, I, I show Brockway Mountain there. If folks have ever been up there, that's that's where that is. Um, and again, here's that that uh, the red rectangle there shows off the where the next couple of pictures are going to be. So this is some of the imagery we use to to identify sites for surveys. You can see the at the bottom of that blue polygon is a black shaded line, and that and this uh, elevation imagery shows us where there's shifts in elevation. And there we said, there's probably a cliff there. And here's a picture that Jesse took from a plane ride he got to take showing that, yes, there's definitely a cliff there sticking out of the forest. Um, and I'll kind of zoom into it. You can see that same cliff in the bottom left. You can see Brockway Mountain behind it, and that's Lake Superior to the north. And as you follow along some of these cliffs, you see these open areas like it's in the bottom, like you see in the bottom right there. And that is an example of a northern bald. So these are these are areas that are getting beat up by the wind and the weather coming off of Lake Superior. And you can see lots of lichens and lots of low growing veg and lots of short trees. And so this is my first, hey, this is what Lake Superior is doing to these ecosystems. These harsh conditions, both the thin to no soil and the exposure to Lake Superior create the unique physiology. So the upper right is what we call a Krumholtz tree. So it's it's living in such a challenging environment that this red oak tree, which you know is probably 50 to 100 years old, can only grow so much because it's got so much working against it. So this this peninsula that is exposed to the lake has all examples of these areas that are shaped very strongly by the weather that's coming off of uh, Lake Superior. Another example of this process, as you go in the low ground and the slopes below some of these cliffs, there's these rich music forests like used to dominate the landscape. Most of them have been cut because they're so productive. Um, and the ones that remain are these ones we uh, somewhat jokingly, somewhat seriously referred to as this Mesic Keweenaw woodland. And one of the features, this is a mature forest we're looking at. And one of the features of this Mesic Keweenaw woodland, which is growing on thin soil with that same exposure to Lake Superior, is that the canopy trees have this unique physiology, much like that Krumholtz tree, not as extreme. But the canopy height is very short. The trees can only grow so high. Um, you know, up to about 60 or so feet. And these, these trees that look young and that are so small, 
are often really, really old. They're just doing as much as they can. So these 10 to 15 inch diameter trees where normally we'd be expecting like a 30 diameter tree to be 200 years old. These ones, this is as big as they're gonna get. They've just been growing really slowly. So that was a really cool thing to see. As a result of this low canopy, um, there was also trees that usually don't make it into the canopy, uh, like ironwood. So it really changed the, the character of some of these forests in, in some pretty cool ways. Um, so moving on to some different forests, I'm gonna be discussing pine oak forests now, which were the most of what's left on the landscape in good, in good shape. And they're, they're associated with these ridgelines specifically uh, because they're less accessible, harder to cut. If you're familiar with Estevant Pines, that is an old growth stand of pine oak forest in the middle of the, of the red rectangle there. So we call these pine oak forests dry music northern forests. And as you can see on the bottom left, they're, they're often on these rocky, rocky landscapes on these slopes that are a little bit harder to get at with uh, modern uh, equipment. Sometimes they're in flatter areas. You can see in this picture that the ground is covered with with uh, pine needles. So you can kind of, that's the dominant species. You see the red oak or, or white pine in this particular case. There's also even drier forests with lots and lots of beautiful blueberries as you can see in the bottom right, but not gonna focus on that too much. And then along the coast and in some of the lower areas of this landscape, we, we have what's called a boreal forest. And these are dominated by white spruce and Northern white cedar. And these are, these are formed by, very much formed by the influence of, of the climate of the lake. So higher humidity, greater snowfall, lower summer temperatures, warmer winter temperatures, summer fog and mist, all because of the influence of the lake. And there's also frequent wind throw events. So lots of trees toppled down and that's all, that's all the lake influence, right? And, and because this the Keweenaw Peninsula is absolutely surrounded by the lake. All of the all of the forested ecosystems that we encountered had a lot of cedar in it, and had lots of uh, balsam fir and frequently white spruce in it because of this, you know, mimicking these boreal forest conditions. Because the Keweenaw Peninsula is surrounded by the lake, and it's getting it's getting the same signals that uh, what you know a boreal forest and a bigger chunk of the peninsula would have gotten. So we especially saw this on the northern slopes that are a little bit more shaded. Um, and we also think that maybe this could have limited red pine, which we did not see much um, on the landscape. So finally, we we'll, we'll want to show some forested and, and open peatlands. So these didn't define the landscape, but they occurred in little patches in between those ridge lines. So I'll first show this this complex between all these lakes. Lake Medora is the big one. Uh, Gull Lake is, a, is, is the one to the west and then Meadow Lake, which is called Bailey's Pond in this, this image. So you can see this little depression. You can see the, the buckling and those, those low ridges that are associated with, with uh, the buckling of this landscape. And you can see in the bottom right, that's, that's the soil core showing the, the peat substrate. So slowly uh, slowly decomposing organic material that forms the substrate of, of these systems. So here's this black spruce dominated poor conifer swamp, sort of isolated from uh, the groundwater influence of so highly acidic. Here is a very groundwater influence rich conifer swamp, and you can see just trees toppled everywhere. They can be very challenging to walk through, but those are sort of the old growth conditions we, we look for. And staying with the groundwater influence, I'm just going to show you a few quick examples of some of the open peatlands that are that are in this landscape. So I'm going to start in the highly alkaline, so high pH groundwater influenced situations. Here is a northern fen, which is the most, you know, the highest on that scale. Behind it is a rich conifer swamp, which is typically how these things form in the landscape and associate with themselves. And so moving down the pH scale, we have a northern wet meadow, which is less influenced by the groundwater. A poor fen, which trends in the slightly acidic. So the word poor kind of ref references a little bit more acidic. Rich tends to mean a little bit more alkaline. And then finally at the very acidic end is bog. So the all examples of all these ecosystems occurred on this 
now 32,000 acres that we surveyed. And finally, we didn't, the, the Keweenaw Heartlands does not contain too much lakeshore uh, access, uh, but there was one little spot that I got to on my very last day and I jumped in the lake for a swim. My The last thing I did before leaving this landscape, uh, my last visit in August, because it was hot, hot, hot. So I jumped in the water and I looked over to my to my side and I thought, oh, here's another natural community I did not have a chance to map. So I'll have to come back here. It's the sandstone bedrock lakeshore community where these pavements of sandstone kind of dominate this level and they get they get covered up with water as the lake levels go up and they get exposed as the, as the lake levels go down. So cool little community. I'll have to go back. There's versions of these lakeshore communities composed of granite, volcanic rocks, and limestone too in the state of Michigan. Generally very little vegetation. And when it is when it occurs, it occurs in the little cracks in between the rocks. So I'll, I'll end by just mentioning a few of the cool plants because I am first and foremost a botanist and I cannot not talk about plants. So up here, most of the rare plants are not uh, too showy by traditional uh, standards, I don't think, but but botanists love them. So especially these sedges, if you know anything about botanists, we're kind of often obsessed with sedges. So it's that clumpy, uh, grassy thing uh, in sort of the center of the screen. Uh, that's a soil core for scale. It's about a meter high. And so this is Ross's sedge. In Michigan, it's limited to uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, it's found in the Rocky Mountains and, and other places out west. But Michigan, it's only in the Keweenaw. Uh, so overall, there there are 24 occurrences of 10, 10 plant rare plant species in the, in this survey area. Uh, we observed seven of them in our surveys. Uh, 14 new occurrences and three updates. There was three species we didn't see. We didn't really go after them. We just sort of encountered them opportunistically. So you can see the the scientific names of them in the bottom right. And then here's some here's some pictures of the stuff. A couple ferns, uh, one grass in the lower right, a uh, little teeny tiny annual called blue lips on the bottom, a another western disjunct uh, species that's common in the west, Douglas hawthorn, the bottom right, and then this this uh, weedy species that is nonetheless rare in Michigan, woodland cudweed. So this that's some of the things that uh, we encountered uh, in terms of rare plants. So. And then one thing that we don't consider rare from a legal standpoint, but is threatened by deer everywhere it occurs, and they 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 just mow this stuff down in the winter, uh, is Canada U. And there's some places on the Keweenaw Heartlands that are so protected by deer that um, that they're that this species is able to thrive like it did historically. So this is in the middle of a uh, middle of a rich conifer swamp with, you know, old growth trees, uh, even foresters did not feel like getting in there. So definitely, and deer did not either. So I'll end, I'll end with, a, with a couple of these pictures here. Uh, this is in the east end of the heartlands looking west out, out over the landscape. Um, this area is being, uh, has, is being transferred to the DNR who will be managing it um, in, you know, hopefully in perpetuity. Uh, here we here we have looking towards the East Bluff from the other side from another ridge line that's Copper Harbor in the sort of upper left, and then looking looking southwest towards the rest of the U, uh, Western UP up from Brockway Mountain. So really, it was a place it was a place with so many great views. I I could have given a presentation simply uh, simply on the views. So. So that's the extent of my slides. I don't know if we're doing questions or not, but I'd be happy to uh, answer any at this point. Cool. Awesome. So thanks so much, Dr. Basket. Thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity.